All right. This is my first time trying this. It's uh, It's been a while since I've done right. anything ink studsy. Uh, here I am talking to El Columbia. El is somewhere high above the mountains in uh, upstate New York, is it? Mm -hmm. In the Catskill Mountain Range. I've never done a video thing like this before. Um, I'm hoping this works out. Apologies to folks if it gets hinked up. Um, I think you're saying your internet is by satellite dish. Yes. Yeah, we're by sat we're having sat we're getting something else put in, but right now it's satellite. So it, it's um, an unstable connection. So I don't know. It could go out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We'll just roll with this and see what happens. Um, yeah, let's see what happens. I keep getting a, a thing on my computer saying the internet connection is unstable. And um, so I'm going by that. I'm, I'm kind of taking in my cue from the, what's showing up on my screen. So but it doesn't seem to have disrupted anything yet between us since we've talked, but it could any minute. Yeah, we'll just roll with it. Um, life is unstable yeah, we'll right just now, roll right? With it. So, yeah, I, yeah, well, of course. So kind of the idea with this is, um, so this is for Van Cath, the Vancouver Comic Art Festival. This is part of our ongoing programming this week uh, that we're doing. And I hadn't talked to Al in a while. I looked online of when we did the last interview and it was 2011. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not, almost 10 years ago. Um, yeah, yeah, a while ago, a while ago. <laughs> uh, so I'm always happy to chat with you again. Um, I, for folks <coughs> not familiar, Al's latest book is, and I'm going to try and get the name right. And I'm going to hold up the thing. It is a big book. I'm going to open it. Hopefully I don't open it to anything too horrific. Is there anything horrific in this book, Al? <laughs> oh, yeah, this one is. Um, Maybe a couple of things. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the book is Amnesia, The Lost Films of Francis D. Longfellow, which was published by um, our, our pals at Floating World on Halloween of, was that 2018? Um, yeah, like, I think so. Like a year and a bit ago? Or, or, or yeah, 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 definitely, definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other recent-ish thing, I think, is the, you have stuff in, I'm floating it by the mirror mirror too by yes, mirror mirror uh julie graffer and sean t collins it's a very nice anthology of some very dark comics two of my favorite there. people two of some of my favorite people yeah. oh yeah there it is yeah <laughs> those aren't too scary i think the things i picked up for that were pretty pretty innocuous you know pretty funny i think not too bad not too, There's a uh, really happy clive barker drawing yeah, yeah. I got to meet Clive Barker a long time ago. I think it was uh, 1991 or two. In, uh, I met him in California, which was kind of cool because I remember just reading his books a few years previous before I even knew I would even be in comics or anything like that. And so it was cool to meet Clive Barker, I remember. You must have been pretty young then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was really young. I think I think when I started doing all that stuff, um, well, I started technically, I guess I started comics when I was 18, really. Uh, but I suppose like publishing and doing all that in my early 20s. Yeah. Was that when yeah. you were still doing the From Beyond when you met Barker? No, no, that was when I was doing, I think I was, I was still at that point doing big numbers. And they sent me on a trip to California for something. And, you know, that's how I met him. Um, I met a lot of people during that period. I think I met everybody yeah. during that period of time. So there was no feeling of ever needing to see them again. You know what I mean? Or, or I mean, I made friends, I made certain friends, but most people say, okay, I met Mobius now. I had dinner with Mobius, you know, that's cool. I clearly can't top that with another dinner with Mobius. <laughs> so I'm just happy I met all these people. And, and a lot of times really, really cool situations too you know really nice way to meet all these people um but you know so there's no cure i have well there's certain people i'd love to meet you know obviously 
you know, in this life, but there are certain people I'd love to, to, to meet. But mostly, uh, as far as comic book people, I feel like I've met everybody in one way or another. Yeah. In one way, even if it's through an email recently, or I'm talking with somebody, it's, you know, I've met them, you know, they become my friends, usually. Yeah. I'd never really so, thought of Mobius as, a, as something within your work, but I guess, like, there's something you guys do where you kind of capture, like, a static image in a particular way. Sure. Yeah. Yep. That like I, I think I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh yeah, he there's things he's done that I, I thought really um kind of blow my mind. You know, like Mobius I think is just one of those guys that's like kinda to me can't really do any wrong really. It's just all his drawings look great. You know, they're just amazing. And he really does capture some really, you know, just some intense stuff, you know. And I saw one picture, it's just just a guy chopping his fingers off on a table. I remember thinking, this is Mobius, but it was. So he's done everything. He's done all kinds of things, you know. So I really like that one particularly, the, the finger chopping part, you know. That was cool. I, I like that cartoon a lot. <laughs> I don't even remember what that is, but of course that's something you would have it's seen. It's just like a three-panel cartoon. <laughs> of course I saw it. Yeah, I managed to see it somehow. He is post. Oh, there it is. There's the finger chopping. Um, we found it. <laughs> one of the things that's going on right now um, that that's kind of weird doing it this way is like living through this pandemic of the COVID nineteen. And and one thing I'm interested in is like when we talk about horror comics and um situations of horror and dread and madness and there's something about like how what's going on especially not far from where you are in in new york and i'm wondering like how that may have been like have you kind of been filtering some of that happening right now or is it just kind of like there's a difference between the horror of reality and the horror of fiction um no, I think you're always filtering. Well, I, how do I put it? It's not, a, it's not, a, this to me seems much less horrific than some of the things I've actually been through. But in the terms of it being a worldwide pandemic, that's scary. Yes, you know, obviously. But it's like, uh, if I filter it, I suppose, just in the way, just in the way you survive. I always, whenever there's something weird's happening or it's not you're making or something like this, you know, I don't, I don't know. You, it, it, after a while, things just start to feel normal again, but maybe they're not. And we all step out again and then we got to go back in again. I don't know. You know, it's hard to say what's going to happen or anything like that. I definitely don't have any idea, but um, I definitely, I think I'm filtering. I'm starting to filter, but more in a fun way. I think the I'm working on a book now for Italian publisher, my, Michelle Nitri uh, called Cheapy the Guinea Pig. So that's how I'm filtering it through this, through this book I'm working on, which is, a sadistic little book, a really wonderful little book. Um, you know, you'll spit out your soup. It's that funny, you know? So it's good stuff. It is fun to do. So I just, I just kind of, uh, um, tend to tend to just kind of, uh, take certain things with a grain of salt, I suppose. Now I don't really worry a lot. And the, the people I'm with now, they're the same way. They don't really worry so much as they just kind of, you know, navigate through it, you know, you just kind of, survive from day to day and that's kind of how you draw it's like you know something's going on and you really can't deal with it it's really kind of hard to draw it's really kind of hard to to filter anything if, if it's too traumatic or upsetting and you know um this has been a very upsetting time you know so i tend to usually work through those times but when this started happening i found i had really it really had me on pause i really uh really didn't feel that almost it was appropriate to think that way for a while or something like i really couldn't draw i really did really couldn't think about putting out books or anything it just seemed ridiculous to even be worried about or you know at that at certain points of the future itself you know but now things seem to uh, um i don't want to say they're normal by any by any means definitely not but um they're 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 tolerable or you know i can work now you know i don't know i don't know how it's been for most people i know i was there are certain people who wanted to keep things the same or, or in the beginning of this and would email me as though nothing had happened or even while there's like the death count in their country is 
and just sort of like, you know, that weird guy who's, who still wants to build that casino, even though it's the end of the world. You know, I got a few of those people definitely kind of, you know, you know, they're more or less harassing you to commit to these big, you know, book projects with them. And you're like, look, I don't even, you know, I don't think this is the time to be talking about it. You know, so certain, some people, I guess it's their way of being optimistic, but it's kind of, it kind of seemed ridiculous to even think about any of that with, for me anyway, I don't know how it's been for everyone, but pretty much everyone I talk to is we've all been on the same page about it. Almost every yeah. day that it's happened, each day gets better. Each day seems a little bit more normal. I don't know. Yeah. I've, so for, I've for talked me, to some it, folks definitely been up till now. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I've, yeah, I've talked to some folks who like are having troubles working on the stuff that they normally would be doing right now, like their regular books and having to do other stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Everything I was working on, I don't feel like I can do now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem right or something. It doesn't, it's like, it's like, it's like my focus before I definitely did, you know, but now, now you just refocus, you just adapt adaptation. You just adapt to a new situation, which I'm good at doing. I suppose I'm, that's one thing I'm good at doing is adapting to new situations and new things, new terrors, new horrors. You just, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I suppose the stuff I'm working on now is just more like, I feel like, uh, you know, the world needs cheapy the guinea pig right now more than they need, you know, some deep, you know, autobiographical, you know, meanderings about my life or myself, you know, or anything like that. So I kind of don't care what, you know, <laughs> you know, that's the last thing I would read right now. I think I don't yeah. care, you know. Do you so want to give? It's more like, you know, go ahead. I would say, do you want to give people a peek at cheapy? Sorry. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, this is kind of silly stuff. It's just the cover, um, which I'm finishing up right now. This is, um, it's a, it's a, a square image with a lot of square images going around it. So there's like comic panels going around this main image, which I will show you. Uh, this is sort of one of the side panels. Wait, yeah, this is one of the side panels. Uh, let me know if you can see that. Yeah. This is cheapy kind of saying his name. His lips are forming the actual, you know, the letter of the word there. And this isn't done. This is this is the the e. So he's saying C H E, and then uh, um, A P I, and um, I love the P G P. Yeah, the P is my, my favorite too. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's kind of it's kind of weird uh, to to try to do that to try to get the lips to really look like essentially what they would look like if you're if you're really saying the the letter or the or the word. Um, here's uh, one of the the, the panel of sequence the sequence going on the, on the bottom of the of the book of the of the cover, and this is just Pete uh, Cheapy going through one of these sort of uh, torture chambers. Let me see if I can get that right. Yeah. Um, they're all more or less the same. He changes a little bit. He moves back and forth. You see his arms change. Um, let me see what else I have. Pretty much done. Almost, I think, done with. I just got to kind of assemble all this now. Um, yeah, and here's the top. I'll show you the top. Then I'll show you the main image. All right, this is kind of funny. I, although I didn't finish. I, I did finish this, but one of the panels is, is in a different, different uh, thing. This is just uh, cheapy with two of two of the doctors or scientists performing, you know, more or less performing these very absurd experiments on them. And poor little you know, cheapy. the buzzsaw comes down, cuts them in half, and then he's yeah, poor little cheapy. Then he's just kind of hanging half and half. And um, these are just obviously some more of the more fun, just ob you know, to me, more fun things you might see in the book whereas but the book gets into it, you know. I think it really gets into it. And it's a it's a good thing to work on. It's you know, um, I think this this pandemic really cut people's lives off at an awkward angle. Uh, I think even in their relationships with other people, their loved ones, everything. You yeah. know, so you know, I feel like it's a perfect thing to work on if 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 there are things that you know aside from the virus that are even bothering me. You know, this is I've discovered this is this is really fun to do. It's extremely fun. It's probably the most fun. I've ever had doing a cartoon character and he's really hard to draw too. He's a very complicated character. I don't know why I designed him that way, but like now every time I draw him, I, you know, I'm sitting there forever trying to get, you know, ink the damn guy. 
you know, it's just the, uh, each time you draw them, it's like, oh, I draw like, you know, four arms and a spinal cord, you know, exposed spinal cord. That's always fun to draw, you know. There's like various stages of completion. Do you kind of just like grab mm -hmm. whatever you're working on and just kind of work on that page for a bit and don't have like, I'm doing page one, two, yeah. three, four. I work, well, this book I'm doing differently as I've been doing a lot of paintings, very intact paintings, like in Amnesia, those are all paintings. That's none of that's like done, you know, none of that was layered in any way with the computer or anything like that. Those are all exactly pretty much, I'm pretty much sure that every single one of those is, is, is looks exactly in person how it does in the book, more or wow. less. You know, I mean, except for maybe the logo is look, might look a little different because I have to kind of paste those down and this and that, but um, it's uh, it's pretty much what you see is what it is, you know. And these I'm this I'm doing all in pieces where I'm doing the characters and backgrounds separately, and adding things to the scene. So this is all going to be done in little pieces. So all the art, all the original art will be will be on separate pieces of paper. Even you know a lot of the backgrounds um, are going to be that way because it's 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 to look animated like animation. So you know I don't really want to repaint an animated painted animated background from in a sequence from panel to panel. So you just kind of use the same background. That's perfectly acceptable, by the way, kids. You can do that. It's a good, good thing to do. Years yeah, ago. You can do that. It's all right. I did an interview with Darrow, with Jeff Darrow, and we're talking about the um, hard-boiled. I don't know if you ever looked at that. And Oh, had, yeah. It's one of my favorite books. Yeah. There's the, the junkyard scene where the one character is, like, stripping down the layers, the, the fat grandma, and then she turns into the sexy robot. Yeah. And that was done kind of animation style. Yeah, like he, I can't remember that. Yeah, he did like one long background and would just like do that drawing on top. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Oh, well, that wor it works for, you know, scenes that are more, you know, still life, you know, where there's a character talking, sitting in a chair, say, and you're not going to repaint that chair for a pale, but some, some, I remember somebody telling me to do that once. I think, I forgot what it was, but, you know, in this, with this purist, uh, sensibility you know, that pure you know that's nice but you can mess with each each panel i suppose a little bit to give it less of a you know so it's maybe a little it could be worn, you know the background could be a little worn out in certain places here and there and but you really should use the same painting otherwise it's just you know it just seems silly to to, to you know you don't have to redraw backgrounds if you don't want to especially if it's the animation i think that, like some people get confused about it about that, and there, I, or I, I know a young guy, this young guy who I, um, this young artist, brilliant young artist, genius, really young kid, who's just, you know, the greatest kid I ever met, just this good kid, and he, and, and there's so many things he didn't know he could do, you know, in art, uh, just just little things, little techniques, little things that I guess when you're really young, you, you don't think, oh, can I do that? Is that okay to do? Like, is it okay to kind of draw these old cartoon characters or, or mess with this old style. Is that okay? You know, you don't really know if it's okay when you're younger. You kind of have all these, you know, and it is. It's perfectly fine. I think anything's fine right now. You can, you know, do a fumetti if you want. You can print. It could be all photographs. It doesn't, yeah. you know, labor isn't the issue, you know. Because, I mean, you've gone through stylistic shifts throughout the years, pretty obviously. Yeah. And is part of that, like, kind of like you had that expectation you know in the early 90s late 80s like this is how you do these comics uh especially post black and white boom uh and doing cute weird stuff wasn't cool you know but is that something where it's like yeah no of... it, yeah oh i definitely felt that like when i think when i i i wondered myself is this okay is this like because i'm not necessarily i wouldn't necessarily look at the like a lot of the old Mickey Mouse comics or a lot of uh, Disney imagery as being very cool, but yeah. it really, you know, it's it, it's not like I'm like just oh I love you know I have to look at Disney cartoons or I love Disney so many. It's not even about that. I didn't even know I, I had some vague sense that this probably wasn't the coolest thing I could be doing at that moment, you know, or something. But I did it anyway because it wasn't about to me, you know, a particularly you know an obsession or a love for the cartoons, but they seemed to speak to me or it seemed to be the best. For certain cartoons I do, that seemed to be the way to do them. It no. just seemed to be the right way to do it, so I did it because it felt right. It more because it felt right, you know, than anything else. And that's how I kind of do everything. If it feels right to me, or it, it seems uh, 
I don't care how uncool it might be. You know, it might become cool. You, you don't know. You yeah. don't know when something's cool until it shows up, you know? But was there a so, point in time you know, where you, uh, where you like resisted doing something? Cause like, you're like, maybe this isn't what I should be doing. And then later it's like, yeah, this of is course. what I should be doing. Of course. Yes. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. A lot. Well, also I was always working on so many different things and I really didn't know which one was the thing I should really, it had been a long time since I had put out a comic of any kind and you sort of get caught up in that. Like, why? Well, I, you know, I'm sure if I put out a comic now, having not put on in 10 years, you know, it might, people might focus on it. So what will that be? You know, like, what will this comic be? What will my first comic in 10 years be? Then you realize you don't even, you can't even think about that anymore. It just, and let the stuff come out whichever way. Don't yeah. think about trying to put out one comic then the next one. And just let your stuff get out there, you know, just kind of pollinate, you know, just kind of let stuff out, let stuff out, let it out little by little. I think it's yeah. pretty cool. People can broadcast a little bit more of that now than they used to be able to do, I suppose, art just online, you know. Um, I think that's, that stuff's pretty cool. But uh, I guess, I, I don't know. I, I, I've, I've thought about that sometimes, like just, just publishing something on, 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 online on my own website or something, something, you know, that I wasn't going to print or just so people could see it, you know. I think people seeing this stuff is more important. If you can get a book published, that's even better. It's always nice to have a book come in the mail that you did, <laughs> you know, a box of your books. That's pretty cool. But it's really, I guess, where, where, where it ends, really. You know, that's the reward, you know, in doing, doing the work. And, you know, if you get it published, that's, you know, to me, the, the finished art is always the printed art in the book. And whatever it takes to get there is what I do, you know. Yeah. There was a lot of people asking um, why no big Al Columbia monograph art book. You've got all this unpublished oh. stuff. You know, anyone that's trolled EA. Oh, yeah. Right. You know. Yeah, there could be. It could be something like that. I did let a lot of the artwork out. Um, different collectors this, this and that. I think um, a lot of the unfinished stuff. Uh, I don't know. I have scans of all that stuff. So it didn't matter to have the originals, I suppose. It didn't really matter to me if I had the originals anymore. You know, and uh, it's just a huge undertaking. And then you just, you know, how good will it really be? I don't know. I don't think I could, I could, I could really match up to Chris Ware's monograph book. That's quite a monograph book. I think that kind of sets a certain standard. I don't know. I don't know if mine would, would be as good. So I, I don't know if I would want to even, you know, try to do that, but some kind of big collection of stuff. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, like cool there's the uh, Abrams yeah. did that really nice um, Jaime book and the Dan Klaus books. Like. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I suppose if I left it in someone else's hands, or which I could never do, I'd have to put it together myself. So, I mean, part of me would just like to give up all those scans, all that, you know, all this artwork and let somebody make a cool book out of it. Somebody like Jordan Crane or something, but yeah. he's a brilliant designer and just also he has a great mind as far as making books. And he originally was somebody I talked to about doing that with a lot of this stuff. So it could still happen someday with, you know, I could still call up Jordan and ask him if he'll still do it, you know. But uh, I, I guess I guess I have so many things going on, or I usually usually I have a lot of things going on. So I just never know which one's going to get finished first. And mm -hmm. I think I'd have to be in a pretty good position, and I, which I am now. I'm in a good spot. You know, maybe that's something to think about. I don't know. You know, got me thinking about it. Let's say, <laughs> good job. I'm sure I have some good content to use for for interviews. Yeah. <laughs> um. That is a really, like, to, to a lot of people, because, it like, I know you've sent me stuff that was, like, you were doing, uh, like, the fake comic book covers, the Pim and Francie sure. stuff, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're all amazing, and it's stuff that people are really thirsty for, and I think it's, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of interest. A lot of folks are, like, why not just put it out? And I, one of the things I was wondering about is, like, what is that balance between, like, you have these expectations. People are like, yo, where's my new book? Um, versus like, oh, sure, yeah. You know, what do you want to have out? Because like I know with the Amnesia book, like that is a structured thing you put out really specifically. And, you know, what is that balance between like people understanding the difference between 
what the book is within its complete sense and what is just kind of being able to kind of do art as a livelihood uh, oh. that doesn't have to. Oh, no, my intention is to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I think it's that idea that like people are dependent on in comics that like everything's got to be printed in a book where when you step outside of comics, you know, uh, painters will have eventual monographs for their books, but quite often a lot of painted work will just sit in the gallery context, you know? Sure, or, yeah. You know, and the, I think I, it's all a matter of what bubbles up. And, yeah. Oh, just what bubbles up, what emerges as being the thing with amnesia. I had no idea I was even going to do that magazine at all. I had done all those paintings and to me, it wasn't enough to, to, to me, I felt like these are cool, but like, are these enough to really justify putting out a publication? Shouldn't there be more material in and around Francis D. Longfellow, you know, like maybe do some kind of, you know, show some of the, the articles written on, about him in his local newspaper when he was alive, things like that, or write my own essay about, you know, what I do know, you know, um, show more still frames, more, you know, make it a little more academic a book or something, you know, or give it that feeling. Uh, and then Art Spiegelman said that they were kind of complete stories. Each image was a complete story, really, and, and that I should definitely put out what I have in some yeah. way or another. So he and Jason Levy convinced me to do it. I had no idea that was, it was the, I even had anything I could put out. I thought I needed to do a lot more material. So, but then I, I was thinking about it. I was like, well, there's essentially 24 stories in that, or 23 stories in that magazine. And, you know, um, I suppose that makes it a little different. Made, made me feel all right about putting it out. Even, you know, and in fact, made it even seem cooler to me just to show a little bit of it, maybe show yeah. more later. But for some reason, that Longfellow stuff isn't um, as uh, urgent to me right now, these days, as it was before. I was really getting into doing that stuff too. So I, I've done a number of covers that could make a second issue. And I, I will finish it. Um, I suppose when I finish this book, I'll finish the next Amnesia. You know, it just doesn't seem to have as great an urgency right now because this is essentially could have, could have been one of the covers or something, everything happening right now, you know? So it's like, you know, mass extinction, you know? Yep. Something like that, maybe a good title. Yeah. But you are, so with the, with the Italian publisher, I can't remember his name, the name of the publishing company right now, um, with Michelle. Um, sorry, my cat. I think it's Paolo Press. Yeah, that's Paolo it. Press. Um, this is Ziggy. I don't know if you've met Ziggy. He's a brat. Ziggy, um, hello, Ziggy. <laughs> um, are you doing anything yeah. else with them? Or just the, the cheapy? Oh, uh, yes. We're, we're reprinting, the republishing, essentially, the biology show. Uh, the two issues that came out, plus it'll have stuff that um, was not published originally and, and some new stuff, too, for it. I think the cover is going to be a new drawing, which has been really fun to kind of rediscover drawing that way, remembering remembering how to do it and uh, or not even how to do it, but just in the spirit of it. It's not going to look the same, obviously, but yeah, they're definitely these are definitely still biologic show drawings. They're, they're fun to do, do some new paintings for the book or I'm still doing them. But um, uh, yeah, so it'll be biologic show, a little book, a little biologic show book. So I think he's working on that right now and he just contacted me and you know, he was, he's over in Italy. So it's kind of heard a lot about that, what was going on over there. So I asked him and his, his whole, he just characterized the whole pandemic as annoying and he was ready to go. So I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to start working too. It is a little annoying, huh? So let's get working. And you know, that, and that was his attitude. So I was like, all right, all right. And he, you know, he was the first person to really, I think, get me going again with, you know, working on anything, and it just sort of was inspiring. His whole attitude was very inspiring to me. So I was like, okay, all right, he's down. He was ready to roll. So am I. I'll do something too. So, is it going to be both issues together or two separate releases? Yeah. No, no. It'll be both. It'll be just a book, a collection. Nice. People will be very excited yeah, about a, that. A collection of all the. Uh, yeah, and a bunch of stuff nobody's seen either from that era. Uh, that I remarkably still have somehow scans of, uh, you know, I, I don't remember even scanning that stuff. So yeah. I also, I also going to do some new stuff. So 
make it a cool little book, you know? It'll and I suppose if this comes out and all this is over with, I'll I'll be going to the Luca Festival with with Michelle. Uh, if that's still going to go on or whenever that is, I don't even know when that is, but uh, he invited me to that before this all kind of broke. So I don't know if that still happens. I'll be there. You know, I think it's in the fall, October, November. So yeah, I think I think uh, maybe things will be all right by then. Hopefully, knock and wood. Yeah. Some uh, some audience questions. Um, one is the okay. much talked about documentary. Is that ever coming out? Oh, probably not. No, no. Uh, can you get into more detail about the construction of Pim and Francie? Uh, its unfinished structure feels very intentionally constructed. So I think that's what the Golden Bears book. I think that was that was an accident too. That was. The, well, I was going to say earlier when you were talking about like back and forth between wanting to publish, so to speak, or just being an artist. For me, I always want to publish stuff, um, but I don't know. It's like whatever seems to, to come up. And I think it's very much the same for Pima Francie. When I started putting that together, is it kind of became what it became just from the simple idea of what I wanted to do with it. I had no intention. I didn't know that's what would happen, in other words. You just have to learn to recognize sometimes when mistakes happen or when things happen that are kind of unique or cool and you can go with that even if it wasn't your original plan you know just kind of travel that way with things just kind of see where they become what they become you know that was more like just letting it was letting this thing become what it was going to become it was i was just helping it along i didn't really have a a, a huge plan i never really do yeah you know, you know? These all just kind of happen aside from me, really. Like even that book, I didn't know that book would come together or even come out. It just felt compelled to do it, so I did, and was encouraged to do that type of book by certain friends of mine. And so it seemed like a worthwhile thing to put my time into. But I didn't really know what I was doing. Obviously, I didn't know. You know, it just so happened to work out that way. You know, is it out of print now, or Can no? It's still, still it? in print, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's a second printing that they did, and I'm pretty sure that's still running good, and you can still buy it. Um, what is your most persistent recurring dream? Um, of very like enormous waves, one after another, rolling into shore, gigantic. You know, not even call them tsunamis because I don't think waves like this truly exist in nature. But in my dreams, they do, and they just look like these great big walls, these great big waves, just like, you know, a thousand feet high, one after another, just getting bigger as they're coming into shore, getting sucked out into the ocean against my will, or everything to do with the ocean is a recurring dream or nightmare for me, that sort of thing. And also, something else I, I seem to dream a lot about, or I have these kind of catch-me-if-you-can dreams where I've bothered some kind of force or some kind of evil force where I'm being where I have to elude like some force some kind of force of evil or for dark force forces uh up and down staircases and through through hallways in this big building and it's sort of like this uh like night of a thousand staircases there's just you can keep going up 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 and you can go down 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 yeah it's weird weird uh dreams where I'm being chased by something you know, I say that's uh, one of the most recurring dreams where I'm eluding, or I'm, and it's, it's kind of fun. It's, there's a thrill to it. Usually after I've trespassed onto somebody's, in somebody's house or something, and I'm looking around, they're not home, then they come home, and I can't really get out of the house. That kind of thing, you know, I have a lot of. I like that so. question. Um, there's a lot of folks that want to know more about your tools, and so it was actually really nice to see the, the, the pages as you're working on. Um, do you have any preferred brushes, pens, nibs, uh, Photoshop? I'll show you what I use. Um, I use, I used to use the 102 nibs. This is a nib, uh, let's see if I can, you dip that in ink. That's what this looks like. Um, there's 107 nibs, 102 nibs that are good for cartooning. And there's also these called zebra maru nibs which are from Japan, which are really good too. Yeah. There's a pen store in Vancouver that has this like amazing array 
of nibs. I'll have to take a look for you. All yeah. they do is sell pets. Yeah, give me some nibs, damn it. How come you haven't sent me any nibs lately, Robin? They'll come with a bottle of maple syrup. All right, cool. All right. Um, uh, someone's asking about your short film experiments because you used to have on one of your websites you'd have some short films uh, and I've seen you've shown mm -hmm. me some stuff um, is that still of yeah. interest oh sure yeah um, yeah I, I mean when when again it's like one of those things that you just do what it feels right to do I don't really, I mean, anytime I've ever planned to film or planned to film something specific, it never really works out. So I kind of wait till I'm there and then I know what I'm doing. It's, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with it until we're all there or, you know, once you put on the makeup and whatever you're going to wear, then you're ready to film. And that's really all, film, you know, you really got to do to get ready to film is if you can put on your makeup and get dressed, you can film, you can get ready to film. So there's the process to that. That's it. That's all you need to do. And then you're ready to go. So, you know, once I get all the makeup done and we know what we look like and something occurs, a theme occurs, you know, a theme will emerge and we just sort of follow that. We don't really know what we're doing while we're filming either until it's done. So, again, just something I do when, when it seems right, when, when, when it's, the, you know, hey, let's film today. It doesn't seem to be, you know, um, a priority right now, though. Yeah. So it could be, it could become one. Would you ever post them online again? Yeah, yeah. Well, if I had a website or something like that, I would definitely do that. I put, put some of the videos up again. Yeah. I'm, I'm moving more towards doing that too. I think I will have a new, web, a different uh, a website you could actually get on your phones this time. I don't know. I was kind of a, kind of a, a dick last time. I kind of made a website you couldn't really get on your phones <laughs> last time I had a website. This time you will, you know, <laughs> just, just being mischievous i suppose you know. i love it um now you can you can you can get on your phone and there will be all kinds of things i suppose and um i might archive this one slightly a little bit more than the other one i i, uh, I might not too it might just be like a you know it goes up it comes down if you catch it you catch it if you don't you don't <laughs> you know which I, I guess i prefer sometimes i figure you know again it's like i said this before but like if once I'm tired of something I have up there, the other people I know will maybe get tired of it like four days, four days from then. So I have like four days to take it down and put something new up, usually. Once I'm tired of it, that's, you know, I figure I've still got about a week, but, you know, I should probably change it or something. So I can't help but do that kind of thing. I love it. People definitely don't feel that way. Um, there's people will just like, save every little snippet that you post if they can um well that, so. may, that makes it like a party you missed or something it's like a lot of times you you know i don't check any archives out anywhere because it's like that already happened so yeah. you know this stuff is very temporal you know the cool thing about putting it out and taking it down is it has a, a better impact i think for the people that see it not everyone's going to see it and that's okay you don't need everyone to see it but if one person sees it and gets it thinks it's cool that's hey you know one person happened to see that little and, and sometimes that would be i'd put something up so quick and take it down so quick one per but one person will always see it you, you know if you put the wrong thing someone saw that and you know i've noticed that too so you really do have to be careful about what you're what you're doing and you know yeah. i try to only put up stuff i, th I think is cool and you know usually if i if i like something other people will will like it too you know and that's kind of the only way i kind of know is what I'm working on is if I like what I'm working on, like on a comic, I figure maybe some other people might too. Not everyone maybe, but that's all right. I don't, I don't care if everyone likes my stuff or not, I guess, you know, not everyone's going to. Someone wants to know what media makes you laugh? What, what? What media makes you laugh? Um, I, I don't know. My sense of humor is a little weird. I'll find things very funny and something that's very serious sometimes uh it's hard to say what will make me laugh a lot of times shows designed to make me laugh usually don't <laughs> you know what i mean a lot of times yeah you know, uh some of them do there's some people i can watch um certain uh but usually if it's supposed to make me laugh i usually i'm kind of a, 
either won't make me laugh or, or, or maybe it will sometimes, but it, I, I, I kind of, I'm not really big on watching comedians or, uh, I mean, I've watched plenty of them, but it's not like my go-to thing. I don't usually like to, I don't usually like when people are making me laugh too much, I guess. I guess it upsets me. Um, sure, I had a good question here. Uh, what was your favorite Hot Pocket? Um, I haven't eaten too many Hot Pockets, but I like, when I have, I've eaten the breakfast Hot Pockets. Someone would like yeah. to know what the Golden Bear is. Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I had a story that dealt with, or was about him and Francie's real parents, you know, sort of like a child, a deep childhood story, story. And I remember, uh, they were using the golden bear honey on with their breakfast in the story. And that's why I called it that. And it just has to do with, the, with, the, with the, you know, those, I suppose those days when that little bear was, you know, a fascinating thing to us. Or I used to love, love that bear when I was a kid. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's really all it is, just golden bear honey. It's just sitting on a table, you know, breakfast time. <laughs> Your use, I suppose. That's what it is. It's a part of your youth maybe you can't even remember or did it really ever happen? You know, those days in your youth that are just idyllic and perfect, you know? I think about like um, the idea of family dinners for you because I got the that one drawing, um, the the eaters. I'll see if I can pull it off the wall and show people. Flush eaters. Let's see, does that show? There. Yeah. Oh. Sure, yeah, that's yeah, that's the panel from Belladonna. Those are the flesh eaters. For some reason I like drawing them. It makes me happy to draw them, I guess. But you're talking about the the bear, the the honey bear, uh, the golden bear, and then looking at that, and I'm wondering, it's like, is there something with family dinners too that jumps out for you, like that weird, yeah, specific for, for family dynamics? Yeah, I have another drawing I've actually done with of flesh eaters having dinner, but it looks more photographic and it's really, it's based on some, it just, I don't know what sometimes when I'll see like, I'll see a photograph of, you know, my, my, my grandmother's family, they're all Polish and they take the most amazing photographs. And I have, a, a, you know, treasure of old photographs from Poland and they're all having dinner and, or having their community, you know, Catholic communion and these amazing ghostly weird pictures you know so the pictures themselves kind of indicate to me that's what it should be called once i'm done but there is something about the family life and the dynamic between people even just sitting at a table that could be really interesting or again things that look normal but aren't you know i think that's what i like the most something i'll i'll, see, I'll, I'll just see a perfectly normal looking photograph of maybe a vase but there's something about the way the light's hitting it or you know it's just being an inanimate object. There could be a charge to it. There could be something about that that's that's eerie, or or weird, or has you know. So I kind of tend to like things that that do look on the surface to be normal, but when you really really look at it, there's something there's something off about it. There's something weird, something not right. Something that's you know makes you feel um, um, kind of unsettled a little maybe, or or uncomfortable, or scared even. You know, there's great directors who seem to understand the power of doing, you know, the way to light a structure or a wall or even a, you know, like Roman Polanski is really good at capturing that, I think, the, the, that sort of nightmare logic and other directors like Lynch and all, all those guys, like even Coppola and, you know, um, Orson Welles, they all seem to have this sense of, of, of lighting, really good sense of yeah. lighting, how to film, you know, how to film stuff. So it almost seemed like it was coming out of a dream or a nightmare, you know, yeah. just one step removed from reality. It was just, you know, really interesting uh, subconscious minds. They, you know, I seem to respond a lot towards that sort of, uh, those sort of authors, those sort of filmmakers, you know, the more subconscious stuff, the more, I suppose, dream, dream like or dream logic or that, that, that sensibility anyway. I see I'm drawn to that stuff for some reason. Um, and I guess I, I just, with my own work, I just want it to be as good as the people I like you know, in some way or another. And that's what you always try for, you know, make something that's just, you know, hey, that's as good as that record I like, I think maybe, maybe it's not, but, you know, um, just something that's maybe could stand up next to the things that I like, 
This is the kind of things that I do, that I try to do. I think yeah, about that, sort of thing. that scene in the, in the first Godfather movie where they're having like the wedding and then there's like the dawn in the really darkly lit room. And I think yeah, I read yeah. somewhere how Coppola was trying to like go for like a candlelit visual and like was like made it really yeah. difficult to film, but also like it really captured that like light and dark, even like within the play of the Yeah, scene. absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's all in the lighting that you create that kind of thing anyway. You know, the type of lighting you're using and, you know, uh, you know how, uh, one of the interesting things about Citizen Kane I really liked was just the deep focus aspect of it where that had really never been done before. And he was using a lot of optical printing. So, which is almost a bit like, you know, you can, you can kind of do the same thing in Photoshop. It's like a really crude, not crude, but it's a very specific thing where you can put something that you filmed into, into the existing frame for that particular scene, even though it really wasn't there when you filmed it kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So Citizen Kane is almost a special effects movie in the sense he used that so much in that movie. And um, I think that was the, um, the thing I liked the most though is the, the deep focus. Because if you take, um, if I drew a, did a painting of a house and I want to have a city behind the house, I don't want to paint that city behind the house on the actual painting. You want to do it bigger and then drop it in there so when it gets smaller, it has that razor sharp kind of sense of focus because you've done it much bigger. And that's what he would do. He would take things that were very well photographed and make them very small, like outside the window or, or, in, a, or in a mirror or something like that, you know? So um, that, that kind of thing always appealed to me. I think when I did Trumpets, They Play, that, that was very much influenced by the way he made Citizen Kane and also the look of it too, in a certain way. I wanted to kind of make an animated film that maybe Stanley Kubrick made, would make or, yeah. or, or Orson Welles or one of those guys. And that's what the whole intention behind that was. Yeah. Was it Kubrick where like he would only film if he could do it like within a certain distance of his house? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah he, I don't think he really wanted to leave. Uh... Well, there's, there's still people who talk about why that is. That it could be, you know, a lot of people think he, he's, helped stage the moon the moon the lunar landings the moon landings that was all filmed by him and that he was afraid for his life and his family's lives because of that for the rest of his life after that happened there's people who, who say that that's what was really going on but who knows you know i know i don't tend i tend to not want to do that either you know if i'm filming something it's usually kind of where i am i don't you know getting yeah. permits for places and that's the other thing too warner Her- herzog's always said that one of the first things you'll tell like a person who wants to do film is you know, learn how to get permits so you can actually film there because you could get kicked out. You know, now you can't, you can't just film everywhere. And uh, so the first thing you want to do is know how to get permits. And I'm really lazy. I would probably never get one. So I like uh, the story. I can understand that. I, I like uh, Alan Moore's refusal to go anywhere. He's like, I got everything I need in one town. I've traveled. Yeah. I didn't like yeah. it. Well, he's also- yeah. Well, he's also somebody who spent most of his life in where he grew up, too, like me. Yeah. You know, I've also done that. We both sort of stayed in our hometowns most of our lives, you know? I mean, we, I mean, he's been places, he's traveled, he's been everywhere, but you know, he chooses to settle down there. And I'm, I was the same way for a long time until where I lived just became such an, a kind of a, a, a dark place to live, just the town itself. Um, just became kind of worse, worse and worse place to be. It's just the vibe was 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 pretty pretty strange. So I think uh, it's good not to be there now. But it, it really really was good to be there then. And I believe Alan doesn't live in Northampton, England anymore. I think he's moved too. So we both finally got out of our hometowns. Maybe you know. Are you now? You went there to to Northampton. Was it pretty similar to yep. to where you grew up? Like that same kind of working class. Small yeah. city. Yes, very much so. Very similar. It's very much probably the the Torrington of uh, of England. You know, I, I, <laughs> it's very similar. Um, it's it's, it's it, it, yeah. It's 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 a very similar vibe. Very everything. Yeah, I, I actually did feel comfortable seeing him there, and he would take me some strange places too. There's a part of Northampton which is just literally where all the criminals live. The bars are run by criminals, like. The cops don't even go into this part of town. And then he took me there, of course. 
And I was really scared. You know, of course, he's probably trying to scare me, but it's true. That's exactly what this place was. But they were all, everyone was super nice to me. And, you know, because you're with Alan, you're good. You know, you're out there, you're, you're good. You're with Alan and, you know, he knows everybody. So, yeah. Or he did then, you know. So I felt safe with him. It's not a place I would ever walk into on my own, though. Yeah. I drove yeah. through there once and went to an old church. It was very neat and weird because it's just like, it definitely feels like you're kind of far away from everything. It's Yes. Yes, you do. Torrington's the same way. Even though there's towns all around Torrington, it's its own thing. It's its yeah. own entity. It's its own beast. It's just there's something like, like almost like there, it, it's... In, in, you know, and you do feel when you're in Torrington very far away from the world itself, even if you have internet, even if you have the television, you feel very far away from everything, you know, like almost like, I don't know how to explain it, you know, uh, so there is that feeling of wanting to go out into the world or to be a part of the world, even though you are already. And it's not like if I move somewhere, I'd really venture out much. I'm, I, I, stay, I work a lot. I'm always, I kind of stay inside a lot. Yeah. I guess I am reclusive. I never thought I was. I'm a social person too. I'm very social, but I do stay home a lot. I do work a lot. And um, I don't really go, I don't go very many places. I'm not very interested in traveling right now anyway. You know, so, you know, I guess I am. I guess I am that way. I, I, I've kind of fought that for a long time. Like, I am not. I talk to people, you know, I, I know people. But um, I guess I don't leave the house, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Earlier, you're talking about the nightmare of the, um, the waves. And I was thinking about how, for the most part, you live pretty inland. And I wonder if there's a, something to that. Yes. Well, when I was younger, when I was a kid, we had a house on the beach in the nearby state of Rhode Island. And it was right, it wasn't right on the beach, with the, but it was right across the street from the beach. And I remember this one year, the tide came in because there was a big storm and the waves were huge. And it really scared the hell out of me, this storm, when I was a little kid. I remember the waves coming in and just surrounding the house itself and, and the water going all the way deep into the houses behind us. So in the morning, you couldn't see it. All you saw was everything was sticking up out of water. For like a mile or something wow and you just felt like you were all these houses were out to sea and that always stuck with me and there's something about that storm particularly i think I, I think i think has always terrified me the idea that there was water coming up on your porch from you know from the ocean itself that you could get swallowed up by all these waves you know that really scared the hell out of me it still does you know i still have dreams about it you know um water you know my my ex-girlfriend has a lot of water dreams too a lot of like you know wave dreams and just water in general water dreams drowning or and i've had them too i think it's a powerful symbol it means something i don't know i don't know just something about like things that are very gigantic and you know even if it's a certain cloud formation in the sky like how big it is the certain like things that are very massive and big and bigger than us and could destroy us or you know really really kind of um fascinate me like where you almost feel like you have vertigo, even though you're standing on the ground looking up at something, you know, yeah. that sort of stuff. That's what that's what those way that's what those dreams remind me of. That it's just just the power of nature, power of something so powerful that you you know, you know, thank God it's a dream. You well, know. the East Coast, you guys get such major storms there. Like I live, you know, the West Coast. You you've lived in the West Coast before. We don't really get these big storms. Uh, we're in the East Coast. You'll have these right. like, tremendous thunderstorms, and oh, the Atlantic Ocean storms. Yeah, very that, different from the Pacific yep. Ocean. Very so different. Interesting. So when you go in the ocean on the East Coast, when you go in the ocean on the East Coast, it's a much different experience, and there's a lot more undertow, and it's dark. The ocean's dark. Yeah, and you know, and, uh, unless you go, you're down in Florida or something where there's like Cocoa Beach and where I've surfed, I've surfed in Cocoa Beach, which don't have really big waves, but you can surf there. Um, I think that's where I learned to surf. And uh, um, you can really see the, you can really see, you know, the water's very clear and blue and really nice and warm and, you know, pleasant. But that's the only place I think on the East Coast I've ever been on a beach that felt like that. The rest of them are just, you know, just the, you know, 
often have a lot of jellyfish in, in there. I remember one summer at the at our house on the beach when I was a kid, you couldn't even go in the water because all the waves were filled with jellyfish. The whole beach was filled with jellyfish, which we of course would smash with rocks. Um okay, yeah. let me look at some more questions here. Um one person just wants to thank you. Another says he loves your comics. No questions, but wish you well. Uh, and looking forward to seeing more work. Uh, such nice people. Thank you. Um, yeah, very nice. Thank you. Uh, one person, uh, when you ink a perfect brush line, uh, do you hesitate to ink the background all the way up to it? Do you leave a white um, halo around it? Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You, again, that's very an intuitive thing. It's a smart question. Um, yeah, sometimes you will, depending on what, how, depending on how, how you want it focused. You know, you sometimes, you know, you know, you don't want tangents. You don't sometimes want things bumping up right up against each other in a picture, in a design sense, you know, um, with that sort of thing, if, it, if it, I really need to do that, I will. You don't always need to do that though. It depends on how deep the scene is. If it's a deep scene with a lot of layers of characters and background, then, oh, I'll definitely do that a lot. Yeah. That was uh, my pal Gareth, who's actually doing a documentary on uh, uh, Harvey Kurtzman right now. I want a copy of that. I want to see that. The, the Kurtzman family gave him some pen nibs of Harvey's that he's very happy with. Oh, nice. Yeah. Does he just use them or does he just hold them down? No, he uses them. Have them on his wall or something. Oh, he uses them. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I've ignored a bunch and I apologize to people. I think we answered some of them and some of them. I just don't feel like asking. Um, one that someone asked and we can kind of unpack a little further because we kind of talked a bit about it is uh, what are some of your favorite films? Um, hmm. Well, well, that's hard to say, I suppose. I, I, I suppose I like a lot, you know, a lot of the same good films everyone likes, you know. Um, I don't really watch movies too much anymore. I, I just don't have the attention span. So I don't know if there's anything new out that I should see or not or whatever, but I, I tend to like a lot of the filmmakers from the 70s. Uh, she said, I like I like Billy Wilder a lot. I like his films. I love uh, you know, Sunset Boulevard, one of my favorite movies. Um, I like Stanley Kubrick's films a lot. I like, of course, like, but everyone likes Stanley Kubrick, you know, he's, you know, you know what I mean? He's one of those, yeah. those, those things you grow up with. If you were a kid in the 70s and 80s, you know, I remember, I remember seeing The Shining when it came out. I think I was like 10 years old and, uh, I'm, you know, so he's always been, you know, anyone who could scare you that bad, <laughs> you know, for so long, you know, uh, with just one, one little movie, you know, I, I always, I always love Stanley Kubrick and uh, I love, uh, I love David Lynch movies. Not, well, maybe not all David Lynch's movies, but like, I, I really like just who he is and, you know, what he does. I, I, I like almost everything he does. And uh, yep. uh, there's something Roman Polanski. I love a lot of his films. Oh, go ahead. There's something interesting which I love about Lynch, which is like there's there's a purity to his vision where there's like there's no yeah. compromise in anything. Um, have you seen the mm -hmm. third season yeah, of Twin Peaks yet? Was, oh, go ahead. Have you seen the third? Yeah, uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. What were your thoughts? The third what? Twin Peaks. On what? Oh, it was really cool. I mean, I, I liked it. I watched the whole the whole thing. Uh, I think uh, Lynch has been a big part of my life since I was I was a kid. Though I was lucky enough to kind of see a lot of his movies when I was pretty young, and so he's always had this indelible, you know, this this kind of he's like in my bloodstream. You know, he's very much is like part of part of I, I think you know like a lot of other artists too, but. Lynch has definitely, definitely always been a part of my, part of my existence, I think, my life, in my blood, definitely. There's, there's something neat that he does and you do. Um, and it's where you can do images that are blatantly horrific 
and do that. But then you can have images that are horrific just as you kind of get more into the image and you understand a little deeper, right? a little further. And it's sure. like the horror yeah. is yeah. much more subdued, but quite horrific once yeah. you really pull it apart. Sure, yeah. And, that, and that, that can be, yeah. I suppose that goes back to just the idea of something looking normal, but isn't. The more you investigate it, the more disturbed you are by what, what is actually happening until it really hits you in the head. When you really get it, but that's sort of by design, you know, you sort of, you sort of make images like that, you know, so that it will have that effect, I think. And it, it hits everyone differently. The more ultra violent, you know, crazy stuff, you know, that, that's not so much, I think I do that kind of stuff. And you want the violence to feel, look like, you know, plausible violence, real violence, or, you know, or at least with cartoon characters, as close to like what they might look like, you know, if something were inflicted on them or this or that, or you, you know, you, you get close to that stuff, but that's also, you do that first and then you kind of make the image of maybe a little funnier than yeah. you know, some of the other, you know? So I, I think I tend to use like a lot of like really, really disturbing violence a lot of times with, with things that are also pretty funny, you know, there's a mix of it. Cause just, because anyone can draw something violent. Anyone can, can do that. Anyone can, but to, to give it the, that irony or that, you know, that sense of irony or, or. Oh, uh, I think I lost you. Oh. Hey, Al. Oh. Hey, how's it going? Sorry. That. I don't know what happened. It just <laughs> shut up. Went right off. That's okay. Um, um just yeah i suppose it depends on what i'm you know trying to trying to the feeling i want to have you know with the piece or you know that i want it to get across you know it's always a very specific thing it's always a very specific thing that i want to do with it you know yeah. so it's never for its own sake you know yeah it's uh part of that is also like that um that you know, like talking about the town you grew up in and Lynch kind of like grabs that uh, small town feeling as well of like that weird pseudo suburban reality. Of yeah, just like my town is very is much like the town of, yeah, 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 definitely. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm a big interrupter. I do that with everybody. We both do you it. Me, me, I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So, yeah, no, the, the town I grew up in couldn't have been more like that, too. And there was that area of town like Lincoln and Blue Velvet that was Frank's world in my town. And that's sort of the world I just came from before I, I moved where I am now. I was very much living in Frank's world in my hometown, very much in the, in, which has gotten a lot worse over the years. But that part of town was always there. Then you had all the neighborhoods and the, the flowers and the beautiful, you know, very pronounced difference between the center of town and downtown yeah. world. And we're in a valley, so all the nicer homes went up, go uphill to the yeah. tippy tops of the hills. And I lived on the tippy tops of the hills. So I never really went into town, you know, over the years I did. But I remember being there in Toronto for a number of years, not knowing how much, how much it has, has decayed. And to see your town, at which in high school was like Maryville, it was like the best Mayberry. It was like the nicest little town. And then to see that decay over the years and see everyone, you know, nobody has money and there's drugs and it's like, and it's just a small little New England town. There's like five churches there and one of them looks just like a big castle, you know, and it's just yeah. weird little town and every town around it's fine. You know, it doesn't suffer from this, but this specific town just again, has its own aura, its own force fields. It's so its own dimension. And it's, it, it, and that's where I grew up and that's where I, and I, and I stayed there. So I watched it go, get darker, darker, and darker. So I, I guess looking back on it, that really did have an effect on me. I think on my, on what I drew and the things I drew and my, my whole sense of, of life, I, I maybe even, you know, or something. Yeah. It's a weird thing to see. It's a weird thing to see over, over su such a long period of time. But now it's just, a, it's, a, it's, it's just a place of death. It's just a really bad place to be, you know? And uh, I was recently there to film and I got stuck there <laughs> for like three months. And, the people I was living with and how it all happened to me. I was sleeping with a knife under my pillow for three months and finally I was rescued. And so now I'm up in the mountains, but you know, I don't think I'll ever even step foot in that town again. Now, now I know not to, now I know it's just, there's 
not even to film, not even to film, you know, because it's an amazing place to film. I mean, trying to just a lot of ancient buildings, a lot of, there's a really ancient factory there that's the size of the Vatican, you know, it's, and you can break in and you can explore it. And it's still all, it's, just, it's a great big dead place. And it's like a big ghost town with a living dead population, very much so, you know, oh, yeah. um, which, which was cool at first. I was, I was liking it until it became real, until it was like the reality of being there sunk in and now it's like oh what am i going to do now you know this virus has, has has happened the virus attack came and uh i was kind of stuck there where i was so luckily I, i'm not there now but th that was definitely a terrible place to go through this in the beginning in this you know bombed out town just bad town you know you know weird stuff yeah. i don't know i'm glad not to be there anymore you know well i hope you uh enjoy this time in the mountains and and rest yeah. and draw. And I think we're all excited to That's meet uh, Cheapy the guinea pig. I hope so. It feels appropriate to work now, I think. I think it's okay to do some work. Maybe put something out, publish something, you know? Yeah. So I like that we're, everyone still wants to do that. I like that it can be, it's, it, you know, we can still do that. So I'm going to do it as long as we can still do it, you know? Yeah. All right. And check out uh, vancaf.com, folks, for more of our online programming. Thank you so much, Al. Thanks. See you.